Welcome to How I Killed My Mother and Other Confessions by the Mafia Hairdresser. This podcast is filled with episodes of my true confessions, harrowing, horrifying, and sometimes uplifting stories about my hair clients and celebrity friends, and of course, all about my mom issues. This is your host, John David, aka The Mafia Hairdresser, author of the novels Mafia Hairdresser and The Glow Stick Gods, all based on my fantastical, crazy life. You can listen to the serial podcast version of Novel 1 and Novel 2 here at The Mafia Hairdresser Chronicles and the hit podcast along with this one, How I Killed My Mother, available at MafiaHairdresser.com. And now on with this episode of How I Killed My Mother. This one's called Meet My Mom. Her movements and mannerisms were quick and feminine, as if she were a magician's assistant showing off the next trick. Like her side of the family, my mom was petite, only five foot five inches, and I might even be stretching it an inch. Her diminutive frame could always be dressed from the sporty, youth, or the junior sections of the department store she bargained bought at. She may have strived to look as posh as she could because she grew up so poor, but she made every shrewd buy garment she bought look like a million dollars. My mom loved the bargain and the good value coupon. She would always brag about buying a cheaper version of a normally expensive item or a good knockoff from a blue light special, even at Kmart. Even up to the day she transitioned, with the exception of the herself with class. Sticking to color blocking, my mom rarely wore prints. Although she did love a basic black and white classic houndstooth pattern, that was part of her personal style. When I was a child, I remember her outfits resembled the fashions of the, of the day, worn by like stars like Marlo Thomas on the TV show That Girl. And Mom could rock an on-trend choker around her neck and long, colorful scarves tied around her short ponytail that flowed down her back to make her look like she had just gone on a walk on the beach in the Hamptons. Her sneakers were always clean and immaculate and never too casual. And mom would wear sassy boots paired with jeans, a tailored tee, and a waist-length bolero-style light jacket like nobody's business. She was of Mexican descent, but her hair was not traditionally long and straight when a young girl. Instead, in high school in the late 50s and into the 60s, she cut her dark brown, almost black hair with auburn highlights, I might add, short like Mia Farrow. She wore it past her shoulders like Lauren Bacall or Elizabeth Montgomery in the 70s, and then medium or short again like Kate Jackson on Scarecrow and Mrs. King or Charlie's Angels. And Mom was fantastic with a blow dryer or rollers, of which she would never wear outside the house like some other housewives might have done at the time she was raising me and my little brother. But at every age, her hair was always done, coiffed, precise, and neat. By the 80s, Mom had stopped coloring her natural white streak, extremely sprouting on the left portion of her side bangs. That streak gave her a sexy, sophisticated Mrs. Robinson touch to her always eternally youthful visage. I loved Mom's hair, always eternally youthful visage. I loved mom's hair. My own hair was a lot like hers for the first 45 years of my life, including that gray streak, although I mostly always covered mine up because I was always too lazy to section it off when I quickly applied tint to my own hair between my clients. Maybe it was her hair or mine that was the seed of my infatuation with cutting and coloring and perming and styling other people's hair. Or maybe it was that day when I was around 12 years old. Mom had taken me to my first unisex salon where the young lady, my mom's hairdresser, gave me my first shag mullet. We didn't call it a mullet back then. And when I went to cosmetology school six and a half years later in 1980, I learned that shags and mullets were called 90 degree cuts to us professionals. Mom was kind of Nosta Avenue, historic Route 66, by the way, in Glendora in 1975, because even at 12 years of age, she knew I wanted to look cool. 
One of the many things we innately had in common, we like to be cool. Just a few days before mom took me to her salon, I put my foot down and refused to go with my dad to his barber to get my haircut done anymore because dad's barber always seemed like he was a butcher of style to me because he wouldn't listen to what I wanted and he always cut my hair too short for the times. I'll always be thankful to my cool mom who took me to that cool salon to make me look cool. Somehow that place and everything in it resonated with me. I remember the smells, clean and chemically citrus smells mixed with cigarette smoke. The walls were painted with bright browns and pinks, and some walls were accentuated with brown and pink flower pattern foil wall pound and pink flower pattern foil wallpaper. There were mod hairdressers running around working on their clients on mod hydraulic styling chairs. I remember that salon sold Germac products, the same shampoos and conditioners my mom bought from there and used at home, the ones I snuck out of her bathroom every chance I could so I could shampoo and condition my own hair with it, and mom never got too angry when I did that. Every time I went to mom's salon, I watched her hairdresser cut and style my hair in the mirror in front of me. The barber dad took me to always turn me away from the mirror. Over time, in my bathroom, at my parents' house, I began to copy what mom's hairdresser had done for me. Soon, I proceeded to cut my own hair, and I continued to do so all the way until I stopped using hair restorers in my midlife. A boyhood friend of mine liked my hair when I was first start cutting it myself, so he asked me to cut another friend asked me to cut theirs, and so on. By the time I was 18, and in my first and only year of college, I was cutting most of my friends' and my co-workers' hair at my dad's two service stations. Then I quit college, and I went to cosmetology school, and the rest is history, as they say. My mom had everything to do with me becoming a hairdresser. Mom was a stay-at-home mom in charge of maintaining the walls, windows, and the innards of our old fixer-upper. It was a house that sat on a plateau in the crevasse of the canyon in the hills in the city of Glendora. The house was the original ranch house that the caretaker of the reservoir water for the orchards in the town lived in. When we moved in, the orchard had already been turned into my neighborhood. And the reservoir below our house, at least under eye level, was then a big decaying cement bowl. And it was then a big decaying cement bowl. And it was dry, unless it was winter, and sometimes there'd be a little lake in it or something with some trees growing in there. And I don't think my mom ever dreamed of marrying dad and then living in L.A. County, let alone raising her kids in such a rural environment. Because we were in the mountains, and then the reservoir below us. So we were sandwiched with a lot of nature. Raccoons broke into the kitchen pantry, and I had a pet squirrel at one time. There were rattlesnakes to be on the lookout for, and we had to constantly clear the brush around the house. And occasionally we'd have to be on alert for forest fires or floods. From my first day in first grade at Sellers Elementary School in Glendora, California, through my graduation at Glendora High School in Glendora, Mom made our home on the hill in Southern California, the place where all of my friends wanted to be and hang out. Mom both parented and disciplined if she had to, and yet she also handled things with love and respect while keeping a close eye on whatever all of us kids did indoors or outdoors because it could be dangerous out there you know hiking in the hills and scaling down into the reservoir to scoop up polywogs to sell to other neighborhood kids was a great kid pastime with me and my friends and she also let us make forts out of the overs- oversized pomegranate bushes in our forest of a backyard. And we'd build wooden birdhouses in our basement workshop with power tools. And we put wheels on ironing boards to race down the private driveway. And we'd camp outside under the stars at night while coyotes howled. Or we played in the treehouse Dad had built, which was two stories off the ground on the side of the mountain. Once mom let my brother kill a five-foot rattlesnake, but not on purpose. When my brother chopped off the snake's head, he proudly carried that dead snake's still spasming body while hanging on the kill shovel into the back porch, and then he asked mom if he could skin it. 
My mom nearly fainted before she broke into tears. It was one of the times I could tell that living with three boys on a mountain was occasionally too much for her. Her life was not like the TV mom's lives I think she wished for. You killed that, screamed my mom. My brother proudly nodded. You said I could. I did not. You asked me if you could kill a rat. At that time, my brother had a little bit of a Cindy Brady lisp. I'm sure it was obvious to me and my brother that he said rat lure, but when it came out to my mother, she heard rat er. <laughs> of course, my mom let him skin it. <sighs> he mounted it on a board. <laughs> Of course, my mom let him skin it. <sighs> he mounted it on a board, sealed it up with a resin, and hung it up in his room, and we called it Mr. Rat. Mom always included me and my brother, as well as my little friends, in her at-home projects. You see, she was practical and great at stimulating her children's minds by giving us skills with our own crafts and as well as tricking us into loving the constant household fixatory that our house constantly needed. She taught us things like how to tape off the lines on the walls of our dining room to paint our own wallpaper designs, how to rescreen an entire patio, sew clothes for our dog, cook, sand and refinish paneling, and how to make homemade Christmas decorations. I believe if I were a child growing up today, my mom would have tried to kiss us practically without TV. When I grew up in the late 60s and 70s, we didn't really get addicted to it. But then again, maybe she could have done that now. I don't know. I don't think many modern moms are able to separate their children from their internet and their mobile devices or TV. My brother and I were lucky to have a mom who didn't have to work outside the home. And we lived in a fabulous old house off of a private drive at the top of a small town cul-de-sac. The San Gabriel Mountains were our backyard, which was better than any old internet. And I wouldn't call us privileged. We were certainly not wealthy. We were just lucky, lucky to have a mom like mine. But mom did love TV and movies, and she shared that with me. And she also shared her love of actors on TV and in movies. She would often let me stay home from school to watch Love American Style, Bewitched, The Guide and Light, or Merv Griffin, if I, Griffin, if I wanted to. She knew I'd make up whatever I had to do at school. I had a gift for skating by. I cherished those times where I'd help her iron the clothes in the living room on those missed school days. Mom always knew all the guest stars' real names on the shows we watched, as well as what they had starred in previously. My mom was one of those moms who had eyes in the back of her head. When I was still a little kid, she knew I'd sneak out of my room at night, past my bedtime, and I'd walk outside in the backyard to pop my head up in the open window behind the couch and crane my neck to watch and listen to the 10 o'clock old movies she'd love to watch on the couch before going to bed herself. I saw the original Phantom of the Opera, Houseboat, and How to Marry a Millionaire before I was eight years old. I really appreciated that mom must have always known when I was out there in the backyard looking in and watch with her, but only if my father had already gone to bed. She certainly didn't want to have him enter into any discussion like how it was past my bedtime or anything that didn't matter to me or her like that. Mom was one of 14 children of her generation, so that meant I had a lot of aunts and uncles and lots and lots of cousins. And because my mom and dad raised me and my brother in Southern California, and mom and dad were raised in Northern California in the Bay Area, where I, where I was also born, that meant that we had a lot of summer guests who visited when school let out for the summers. My mom was the most gracious hostess to our close family, as well as to all of my parents' young lifetime of friends who visited as well. 
I look back and I admire how she tirelessly and meticulously made meals, kept the adults liquored up, and how she tirelessly and meticulously made meals, kept the adults liquored up and conversing over card games. And then she'd let us kids mess up her previously spotless kitchen so we could bake and creatively frost cakes with graham crackers and licorice smash candy canes and whatever, and plastic army men. Every summer, Mom would cook, clean, and do laundry, as well as entertain our guests, all the while making all these times with the company seem fun, memorable, and magical for everyone, especially me. Every visiting family would want to go to Disneyland, not Sperry Farm, Universal Studios, and Magic Mountain. Not only did mom attend to her own family and our guests when we were at home, but she'd always go with us to the amusement parks because we begged her to do so. Even if she was exhausted going, she went. Me and my cousins always agreed that my mom was the most fun adult to go on all the rides with. She laughed, and she screamed, and she teased and cajoled us on all the scary rides, and Mom always made sure we got all the candy and junk food we wanted in between the waiting in lines for the rides. Mom had the energy of ten women, and Mom was a great cook, excellent, despite my dad's mom, Ruth, one of the two adorable grandmas I was blessed to have in my life. And uh, my grandma, Ruth, was the one who would always try and teach and influence my mom with her own precisionly measured, strictly reciped, followed cooking method. Mom had her own way, maybe because she was one of 14 children, poor with the Mexican immigrant parents. My mother learned to make meals out of nothing. She was the kind of cook that could figure out how to make a dish with one can and some salt and pepper. I think mom learned to be uh, smart and creative because she didn't grow up with money and then she got married and had to use her skills to stretch every dollar and pinch every penny out of what little profits my dad could scrape from the early years of owning his first Shell gas station during my grade school years. I still have the free stainless steel silverware she collected by buying groceries and using points occurred at Stater Brothers Grocery Store, the grocery store next to her hair salon on Alasta Avenue. One of my favorite childhood dishes that I love, I'm going to gross you out, I'm sorry. I loved it and I remember it. Is not one that I would recommend, but I loved it because my mom had come up with it when my parents must have been dirt poor, probably when my dad went to college at San Jose State, and they were still living in student housing with a state, and they were still living in student housing with a new baby, which was me. The um, dish was called Rock Stew. Rock stew was made with two 16-ounce cans of tomato sauce, tomato paste, peeled and cubed potatoes and Italian seasoning, salt, and liberal amounts of pepper. But there's one more ingredient. It is less than bite-sized slices of hot dogs. You must bring all of those ingredients to a boil. Then let this easy, all-American, one-pot Italian bastardization simmer for an hour until the hot dogs blow up to a full bite size and the potatoes break up and break down enough to thicken the sauce to a chalky stew. Then serve with bread and butter and you eat and mop up. My mom made rock stew mysterical by telling my dad and me, telling my dad and me and my little brother that she made the dish with a special rock stew rock, which had been handed down from her mother and by her grandmother to my Delia Lopez grandmother. It was the rock that gave the stew that special flavor. It was actually the pepper. As a curious kid who was never kicked out of the kitchen when my mom or my aunts or my grandmothers cooked, I mostly shut up and I learned a lot. But a good 10 years of my childhood life, I was constantly asking my mom to see that special flavoring rock whenever she was cooking rock stew. The answer to all my pleading to see that rock was always, just as soon as the stew is done, dear, I'll show it to you. 
You can't take it out of the stew right now, or it will ruin the whole dish. Now go set the table. But when dinner was served, she'd tell me that she had already put the rock, already put the rock away. Then she'd shrug it off by telling me she'd show it to me the next time. I'm older now, and I'm very thankful that I can cook like my mom, as well as my grandma Ruth, and my beloved grandma Delia, and a few of my aunts. I cook like them, and I have lots of their recipes. I can follow a recipe, but I can cook with just a few ingredients or go into somebody's pantry and whip up something great. At the age of 35, I had already moved to Chicago by five years, and I decided that I'd like to make rock stew for my Chicago friends. I thought it would be a perfect dish for a Halloween party that I was throwing at my big city apartment. I made the recipe the exact same way my mom did, only that time I sliced the hot dogs in half. And then, very creatively, I made a slit around one end of each cylindrical pole and sculpted a tip. When cooked, the wieners plumped so they looked exactly like a dismembered penis. I thought it was perfect. It had a Halloween theme and was campy, and I had mostly gay men attending the party. Alas, I was in the Midwest. And they're humorless, basically. In retrospect, I had actually done a disservice to my mother's cooking reputation and recipe with my hot dog modification. No one at the party touched my mother's famous rock stew because it looked too real. I don't think I ever made rock stew again, even with the proper bite-sized cuts of hot dogs. But you can try the recipe yourself, without my holiday variation, of course. I know you'll love it. So my mom, Manuelita Marie Lopez, grew up with her mother and a strict father who my aunts told me was an alcoholic, told me was an alcoholic. Because mom never spoke to me about his drinking, I believe she may have historically glossed away some of his shortcomings. Um, he passed away around the time I was born, so I think that she carried a little sadness in her heart that her father never really got to experience her, her with her own child. And as I said before, my mom had six brothers and five sisters. Two other of her siblings had died very young. When my mom was 15, her Catholic Mexican-American family moved from Colorado, where she was born, to the small, mostly white, middle-class town. It was called Antioch in Northern California. As soon as they arrived in their small, modest house in California, my mom immediately put down the edict that she would no longer speak Spanish, the language her family had mostly spoken in their own home. Mom wanted to assimilate and be more like the young to assimilate and be more like the young stars she saw at the movies. At the very least, she wanted to fit into her new high school and be popular. My aunts and uncles told me this when I was an adult, but at the time they teased their middle sister mercilessly for putting on airs and trying to be what she was not, a chic white girl with movie star short hair. But my mom had dreams of living differently than how she grew up, poor, Mexican, overcrowded. Neither me nor my brother learned Spanish. We were the only ones of my cousins who didn't, and I recall talking about that to my mom a few years later before she died. What was I thinking was all she could say. I think from the day she met him in her new high school, mom set her sights on my dad, a college-bound scholar named John Donald Elsher. He was from a prominent family, and he was the whitest, wide, red-haired, horn-rimmed glasses-wearing popular boy in high school. And they began dating shortly after they met. Dad graduated a year ahead of my mom, but they continued to date in her senior year. Then Dad flew to Turkey to work for a rich uncle who was a house developer. And Dad liked history, so he also worked on archaeological digs for universities. And then he ended up quitting his job with his uncle and began working as a civilian for the U.S. government in Turkey. Missing my mom, Dad called her on the phone when she had graduated from high school and he proposed. Mom picked out a dress with my grandma, Delia Lopez, in Antioch, and then my mother flew to Turkey to marry my dad. 
What a brave young woman she was. And then nine months later, both of my parents flew back to the United States to have me born in Antioch General Hospital. Dad went to college. Dad went to college at San Jose State as a history uh, major. Out of college, he worked for a company that trained him to go around and tell all the shell service stations in Southern California uh, so that he could help them with their promotions and all that stuff. That took my small family to San Bernardino. And uh, Dad saved enough money and borrowed some from his father, my grandfather Don, so he could open his one shell service station, which then took us to Glendora, California. My little brother had come along just before I started first grade. Now, long before she married Dad, way back when she was that young girl from Colorado, my mom formulated a clear vision of the life and the family she wanted to have and raised. And she stuck to that vision. She raised a family like the perfect ladies did at the movies and on TV. She mimicked how they wore their hair and even what they put on the table for their family meals. I remember grocery shopping with my mom at Stater Brothers Grocery Store in Glendora, and my mom told me to fetch a bottle of dishwashing soap off the shelf. We always had the yellow liquid kind at home, so I made the executive decision to shake things up and get the blue-colored liquid. When I brought the dishwashing soap back to mom, she said, Oh no, dear, not that one. Go back and get the Lemon Fresh Joy, the one we always used. It's better. Then she pointed to the bottle that was in my hand. That one's for poor people. It was important to her to have and present the best, even if it was only for herself to notice. I have to say that it was her, only her own family in Antioch who noticed that my mom did things like dress, act, or buy things in a certain way, which were not the ways she was brought up. But in Southern Cal, everyone my like my mother in many ways. For instance, I created a vision of what I wanted in my life to be, and I never wavered until I was forced to through life experience or whatever happened. But there was a time when I became my mom's biggest nemesis to her vision of how her own family would be raised and what it was going to be like. I chose my own vision for my own life, and it did not fit hers. It was the darkest time between my mother and myself. And that was the time she found out I was gay. Thanks for listening. New episodes drop most every Monday. To know more about me, John David, or read my books, as well as listen to the podcast episodes of Mafia Hairdresser, The Glow Stick Gods, John David and Goliath, or more episodes of How I Killed My Mother, just go to MafiaHairdresser.com. Don't forget to like and subscribe and comment at will. I am Mafia Hairdresser on and comment at will. I am Mafia Hairdresser on social media.